So basically tonight we're continuing our Complete Guide to Light and um, in the sections what we've got planned uh, we've got just looking at um, the different types of light in from boudoir uh, from start to finish and things really. So if this is the first time that you've actually been on the Complete Guide to Light series uh, I basically wanted to complete a whole host every other week or every week, whoever they could fit it into my diary during this this year, our 10th anniversary of Photo Training for You and the Photographer Academy. And basically, uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, we were continuing on our education. And for a, a special thag, thank you to our members at the end of the year. Um, we're going to be producing a, a PDF uh, free book, um, which will actually be featuring lots of the images that we've ch chosen during the series to talk about, along with diagrams and everything else within things really. So make sure that um, your uh, membership doesn't expire before we actually give it away on our very special date and things really. So um, as we've been talking about uh, flash and use of natural light and continuous light and how it's used in the specialist kind of um, different for the formats, we're looking at uh, tonight, as I said, uh, boudoir and actually how it's used specifically in studio. Okay, we will be doing another one where we're looking at daylight and actually how we can maximise it as well as actually enhancing it with a little bit of continuous lighting as well. So tonight is all about flash, um, but it's not designed to make it look like really it's studio flash. It's to make it look like it's a daylight light and things really. So. Um, any questions, I'm still going to be on the question panel, but I'm going to be doing them at the end of the night instead of actually asking Jay if there's anything he wants to talk about and so on. So please bear with uh, bear with me. I'm going to try and do my best. I haven't done a webinar by myself in a very long time. So please, no chaos. Right, so uh, what I've done is basically I switch up the categories as always looking at different sections. So during tonight, we're going to cover using window light a little bit, but that's right at the end. We're going to talk about setting up the flash, but more it's actually its position the accessories that we're going to put on the front to change the look and the feel. We're going to be exploring the difference between soft light and versus a hard light and how it will mix differently into the session itself. Um, <clears throat> As far as the continuous light is concerned, it's spelled wrong on there anyway, um, but as far as the continuous light is concerned, we're really not touching on that in this session. As I said, we're going to talk about that in another one for Birdwar in uh, about six weeks' time, where we're talking about daylight and uh, continuous light. Um, but as far as the, the difference between the continuous light and the flash is concerned, obviously flash I usually use to overpower any ambient light within the scene, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of today, as I said. We're definitely going to be looking at the difference between small light and big, big light, and the difference and the dramatic effect that it has, and some of the color balance issues that you might have um, when you're trying to actually kind of play around and experiment and even mix lighting as well. So remember, get the questions into the question, uh, the question panel during the session, and we'll tackle them all at the end. So uh, what I've done is basically uh, towards uh, the, the last part of this session tonight, I'm featuring, um, uh, suggested to by the team here, that we look at um, one of the films that will basically uh, give you an idea of actually how it's all being used. So um, this film features Charlotte, uh, a dancer that I photographed for a couple of years, but never photographed her in any other way except for dance. And we were doing a series of uh, boudoir, and we were making this obviously for the academy. And we basically wanted to uh, get people in who've never had a boudoir of all ages. And we technically had people in from Charlotte's age, about 21, 22, right through to 60 plus. And it was to actually kind of experiment and show the difference, but the same as far as the boudoir is concerned and the same lighting kind of tra control and everything else. So we're, fe uh, we're featuring some of the images and the setups from this film, so you'll be able to actually go and watch this over the bank holiday perhaps, um, uh, or actually at some stage for you to kind of, kind of follow it through. So the first thing uh, to look at is um, I, I mentioned that uh, we're looking at studio flash in a studio way. Some of you will know I work um, from an old converted church. I've basically done that for about eight, eight years, five years from the current church and three years before that. Um, and then basically um, I had a studio in the grounds of our home uh, while I was retired for seven years. And then before that, I was a shopkeeper. In other words, I had 
uh, high street premises with studio premises actually there and then. So they weren't big spaces. So I'm working in now more of a commercial size of studio, but of course I've got to make it more like a small little room set. So the kind of space that I often use and often see is no similar, uh, dissimilar than perhaps a, a client's modern three bedroom kind of home that you would expect. Um, <clears throat> not as big as a boutique hotel and things really. So the first thing that I look at is what type of lighting do I want to actually use as our standard throughout the, the, the kind of my style. And one of the things that we've talked about during the uh, Complete Guide to Light sessions is obviously looking at certain looks and finishes, but it's more based around what you like. So that's what you've got to identify with. Um, as a commercial photographer of old, basically my job was to actually suit what the commercial clients requested, whereas a portrait photographer, um, I'm basically presenting the client the best way possible. It's my job to use the right light source, the right look, the right feel to make them look at their best and so on. <clears throat> So in this case, um, I often use a very, very big light, light source, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, which uh, basically is a big high highlight, a last light um, highlight behind um, lots of netting behind a background support. It's not used um, officially as an extra layer of diffusion, even though obviously that's what it does. It's really used to create a set within a small space. <clears throat> I usually have some ambient light, in other words, room lamps, room lights um, go in so we bring some natural glow to a room. Even in a commercial world, we would have basically created a ambient light to give the warmth, which would often use be gel and small little flashes positioned in strategic places to bring an eye through the, the kind of the whole set. And then basically, um, in addition here, I've also got another light on a stand. In this case, I'm using an Elinchrom poly stand. Um, it's basically a portable boom arm that will kind of pack away into a small convertible car if you've got that kind of size. I drive a big truck, so it's no different there. Um, but in the front of it, you'll often find, instead of just the beauty dish, I've actually got a gridded beauty dish. And that's what we're going to see quite a lot of tonight. I like a, a, a controlled source, so it's almost like a Hollywood style of lighting going throughout. So when we're using the soft light, um, obviously I want it to be as close to the subject as possible. And by doing that, basically I'm just going to move the bed across so it's very, very close, whether it's in this case where you're just seeing a mattress on a floor or a blow up bed or in a room set uh, with our kind of room set bed, as it were. But we want to get as close to the light so it, awfully, uh, it obviously kind of creates more of a softer light source. Um, because of its size and because of the height of our ceilings in the church, there's no real bounce or wrap around. So so unlike in a small studio space where basically the light bounces off all the kind of the surfaces would bring in a natural fill, um, we don't really have that at all because basically it just evaporates itself. And because it's a big light source um, and it's not a soft box as such, it doesn't have the effect of being able to feather the light when the subject is physically in the light itself. So there's no wrap around, no bouncing off side panels like we discussed before in soft boxes. So um, what we're going to have is any time she looks directly at camera, and um, because we've got the light at the uh, nine o'clock position here, basically we will have a slight split of the light. So with my boudoir photography, very rarely anyway does the subject look at me uh, <coughs> uh, for the majority of the shoot anyway. Um, but I've got to make sure that if she is going to look at me, I soften that kind of look a little bit more. So in that case, I start to use a bounce panel, uh, which can often be the likes of a polystyrene board or a special reflector panel to actually bounce some of the light. But we don't want to get into the habit of just using that light itself for no other reason. You know, it has to have a reason. One light to do one job, it must contaminate. But a reflector panel is good, especially when I'm pretty much shooting against the light the whole time. So when we get in close in here, how would you meet meter for this? The first thing would be is from the nose back to the light source. So when we start to use a meter and it has the dome on it, 
yeah? Basically, what we we'll want to do is actually point it slight. Uh, so if you imagine it's flat, so it's horizontal to the bed, and we tilt it back towards the light source at around about a 45 degrees, and that allows for some of the shadow kind of exposure going throughout. Without the reflector panel, pretty much we just have a muddy uh, image with no contrast at all. If you get the uh, subject too close to the reflector panel, it basically just fills it in and flattens it off, of course, and you've got to be careful that you don't flatten and fatten uh, a fuller subject. So an average woman size in the UK today is, I believe, 14 to 16. So if I was using a, a big reflector flat like you see in here to push all the light back into that normal body, body shape, probably it's going to add a couple of pounds to the subject. So that's why we will use shadow for actually the thinner effect. So just, so just be aware when you're using reflectors, you are adding weight onto the subject as well. So um, in this style of photography now, um, it looks like it's a window light from behind and it's burning out, of course. There's two different photographs here. Um, in fact, one is with the reflector panel in place and one is without, as you can see, but it's more than that. In fact, it's a change in exposure. So because now the camera is basically on the same side as the, the kind of the biggest part of the body, I'm now opening up the exposure by one stop, even with the reflector panel, to give more illumination to the visibility of the skin towards me. Um, if I didn't do this, we're creating, as you can see on the right hand side, a little bit more like a silhouette effect rather than actually a narrowed down lighting. So be very careful when we're using the light. <clears throat> in the same way, we saw this kind of image in the beginning where she's looking at me, but we didn't use the reflector panel in place. And this is what that reflector board is just giving that lovely little bit of fill as we go. The same when we're working from above and photographing down, whether it's natural light or flash to the one side. Basically, what we're doing here is using the reflector panel, uh, in this case, turn from the, ver uh, the vertical to the horizontal to actually illuminate more of the size and the shape. But when I'm photographing towards the flash, towards the soft box, yeah, this big um, uh, highlight, it's called, in, in the background, it's got to be very similar to a window. And I want actually that window to be the brightest point, and I almost want to create a silhouette effect on the subject to bring more drama into the scene. So not all the time do we want reflector in shot. We want to create the drama of the actual limited light. And of course, if I want to change that fully, I can start to add a flash. In this case, it's a um, barn doors um, onto uh, the subject. And I'm basically meet metering it um, around about um, a stop. Uh, sorry, around about the same exposure as the highlight coming through. So it still kind of bleeds it. But what we've brought in is contrast. As you can see in the shadow below the chin, we've created a darkness there. And obviously that means that we're creating a contrast within the whole image. So it will print exceptional, but it will look more commercial compared to the softness of daylight that we've seen in all the other images. So let's look at that lighting now in a bit of a session flow. Uh, we're using Kelsey's again for a minute. Kel uh, Kelsey's our go-to local model here. Uh, she's good as gold. We've used her for years. Never lets me down. And ba basically, she's good when I'm doing my work, uh, my workshops with boudoir and fashion and so on. Some of you have actually been down for workshops in the past, and you know how nat natural she is. She doesn't overdo it. So she is like the girl next door. Um, so for me in the session flow, the first thing I want to do is start with that big light source as a window light like we saw, okay? With no reflector panel now, this is just the light spilling around onto the face. She's into the netting and it's allowing it to kind of come across. Um, when she starts to look at me though, we start to see the problem with the catch light in the eye. And as I've already said to you, very few of the photographs during a normal shoot for me would be where she's looking at me. So avoid from getting the model to photographer look. Instead, remember, theoretically in boudoir photography, you're looking through the keyhole. So in other words, it's a, um, a fantasy, a relationship uh, between her and her fictitious boyfriend, power partner, girlfriend, whoever, um, and not really a relationship between you and the uh, model themselves, okay? So this would usually be shot where she's just looking down towards the side. 
Now, fingers crossed, you can see already the difference in those two shots from the first image being lovely and warm. This is my preferred look and feel to the boudoir, the home, compared to a fully corrected white balance uh, from the shirt itself. So remember, as far as the white balance is concerned, I'm going to be looking more at a warmth than I will uh, as far as a coldness is concerned. So I want that almost tungsten feeling from the model at uh, the modeling bulb uh, to actually kind of come through. And of course, the benefit for us, we can do that in the post production to just warm everything up. When we're putting the, sub, uh, the subject against the big light source again, and we're turning the body towards that light, you will get some lovely uh, kind of feather now uh, where it starts to mold itself around the body. And remember what we're always trying to do is create a three-dimensional bust. If you can create a cleavage, in other words, shadow on one side, um, so where we're looking towards the subject, we're creating the shadow visible to us. Um, basically, you will create a more uh, voluptuous shaped woman. So a woman with a small bust will have an increased bust size. A woman with a fuller bust, in fact, the shadow will decrease the bust size by itself. But just by turning the body towards the light, uh, the light source, that's how we manipulate the light rather than moving the light like we've seen in other sessions. Of course, when we start to turn the body away from the light source more and more, we start to actually lose the wrap. In this case, she's physically, her back is horizontal to the actual light source, all right? And then it's um, because she's almost leaning against it, we get the wrap coming around from both sides. And it depends on where you position the light um, in the highlight itself. So they're designed to either to be used from both ends, pointing in towards the white box to bounce off the white background and come back towards the sub uh, the subject. But of course, very few times I'm using two lights in the box. I usually use it from one side or the other. And obviously, if you point it towards the subject, <clears throat> In other words, here, if it's coming from the left-hand side and bouncing off the left-hand uh, inner part of the softbox, and then it comes back towards her, it's going to have an increased amount of contrast on her face. So in other words, more specular white light will hit her compared as if it was coming from the other end. So if I had the, soft, uh, uh, the flashlight in the opposite end of the highlight and pointing almost um, along the gaze of the nose, so bouncing off the back wall to actually kind of light what is the back of the head, the light would be much softer, but her face would be a near silhouette at this point. So it's only because I'm bouncing the light off the inner left-hand side of the wall. She's looking towards the left-hand side of the soft box, and that is what is bringing the light coming onto the face itself. So when we start to allow the light to come across and over the top, it starts to take on a lot more of a daylight effect and how it begins to wrap. So how we position the body is not always in a vertical body shape when they're laying on their side. It's more a roll away. So we start to even have some of the lights start to wrap around. The only thing you've got to watch out for, as I've said before, is when they're looking at you, the client, um, that if you don't have some form of catch light in the eye, the eyes can look quite dark. So now you can see the difference here between the last shot where the light is from behind and wrapping across the top and towards camera position compared to now coming in from the nine o'clock position. We've moved the camera, uh, the camera position closer to the light source. So now, whereas we saw it in the first um, set, setup shot where the bed is um, against the wall, the camera would be at the six o'clock position if it was at the foot of the bed. Now, because I've rotated the, cam uh, the camera, so in other words, I've moved camera position, moved my body towards a, a clockwise position. So I've created a new six o'clock the light which was at the nine o'clock position, if you if you don't know what I'm on about with the clock, you'll have to go back and watch the clock and compass kind of session that we did on this complete guide to light, all right? It'll, it'll make sense as we go through the day. <clears throat> um, but here, by turning her head towards the light source, I've moved myself into the light source. We've got this very big, soft wrapping light, but still with a beautiful shadow amongst the whole image. And all we've got, if you look in the top right-hand corner there, you can see that lovely bit of illumination coming in from the room lamp that just adds that three-dimensional effect. So again, warmth is key. When you're changing your position, the client might be knelt up the one minute, laying down the next minute. So a big light source is best because it will allow the light to actually flow. 
remembering as the subject moves away from the light source for every two feet it's around about a stop lossage in exposure so you either need to actually change your exposure by increasing the flash or change the exposure by opening up your aperture or increase or, or increasing the ISO so um, basically one of those three elements has got to change to maintain a perfect exposure when we start to actually bring a little bit more focus onto the face we'll often use either the likes of snoots um, honeycombs or even a mirror um, to actually focus in the light just on the sharpness of the face so we naturally vignette the body and the rest of the scene when we want to actually have even illumination across the whole image we need the big light source when we need the softness to the light we need a big light source when we're looking to have an overhead and a wrap, we need a big light source and a high light source to allow it to wrap. When we're shooting against the light, we either have to decide to go for a silhouette or we need to expose with a new exposure pointing back towards camera position. So when you start to see the difference of an image now, you can tell here, just from what I've just said, that this is a bigger, softer light source compared to this image, which is focused in more as far as the um, barn doors is concerned. However, when we turn the head away from the light, all of a sudden there's no catch light now. We start to create the dark shadows. Doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does um, at times look bad, especially if you've got the girl smiling at you or the woman smiling at you. So this is a little bit more of a fashion style kind of bourgeois, a little bit more of a commercial ad. Whereas if I wanted a smiling and looking towards me fully, I'd go for the softer light source here that we're seeing in the, the vertical image. Okay. <clears throat> So the skin tone is the essential. I'm, I'm okay to burn out a little bit of the highlight of the skin um, nearest to the light source. I can bring around about a quarter to a half a stop back if I need to paint it in, um, but I don't want to really burn detail out. So critical exposure from nose to the, um, uh, to the light source is the first part. So it doesn't matter. As long as the distance is the same from whatever part of the body that we're photographing, we can maintain the same exposure. Remembering when we start to turn the body away from the light, we need to kick it in. So what you're seeing here is an extreme light now, raw flash coming back towards camera position. And we're using just a soft light source, a reflector, to pop in a little bit of light actually back onto the face. Whereas here, we're using the soft light source onto the wall and allowing the actual wrap. So it's coming in from the left-hand side. It lights the face. We've got shadow on the right side. We've got shadow on the back. So we're sculpting the body and everything that we're doing. Whereas here, we've gone for a little bit more of a Hollywood look and feel. So now we've got a snoot or a honeycomb effect onto the face. And then we've got a separation light running at the 10 o'clock position to actually give the edginess uh, as far as the highlight on the body. Remember, by design, the separation light is, all, is always one stop less than the key light. Uh, at some levels, it should be two stops less than the key, the key light. But as a rule of thumb, you can start with one stop below. So be careful when you turn the body though. So all we've done here is we've got the correct expo exposure. I'm at the six o'clock position. The light itself that is illuminating the face, the key light, the main light source is a small light source and that's coming in from a four o'clock uh, kind of positioning. We can tell that from the increased shadow on the cheek line. Um, it's high enough to put a catch light in the eye and not too high that it disappears the catch light within the eye. So whereas we talk about a two o'clock catch light, that's what we're looking for in the eye by design, but it doesn't always have to exist, but it often will look better when the subject is looking at you. So with a 10 o'clock separation light running, as I move the camera around, and what's worse, I turn the body away from camera to catch more of the light on to the chest. You can see now how light increases its, bright, its brightness with the angle of reflectancy. So there's a saying that is the light from behind appears twice as bright, and that's a perfect example. So as the moonlight hits a puddle and reflects back, it increases its inten intensity compared to what the moonlight is. The same with sunlight as it hits a bride's wed wedding dress, which is angled and then reflects and increases its exposure. So you always burn out the detail there. So be careful when you're turning the body shapes um, because it will drastically change the image exposure. 
when we're photographing against the um, uh, likes of a window like we are here, in this case, we're still adding in some supplementary light. This could be done with a mirror. It could be done with, in this case, an LED light or a bit of flash. Um, but you just need to actually bring the focus to the image with a hot light. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do with flash or continuous or a torch or whatever it be, is actually just bring that little bit of light in available. But you've got to make the decision as far as the exposure. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm exposing for the window. So I have a darker background. And now I need to add extra light onto the subject to bring out the details like uh, the bottom, like the actual uh, shoes and so on with it. Without that extra light coming in, she would be in a sil silhouette. So in the same way as you're seeing here, this is just reflected light bouncing off the bed and filling back in to the bottom of the buttocks. Uh, it's filling in underneath the chin and so on with it. If she looked at me, this image would be absolutely horrendous. When we turn the subject into the sunlight, so now the sun is streaming through. Um, because of the big church windows that I've got, I've got all the small little panes of glass. It's a nightmare in color balance. Um, however, it's always going to kind of dapple light no matter what on a sunny day. But what I'm trying to do is make sure that some of that spotlight is actually coming onto the face. And if I can't get it in the perfect place, then I'll actually use a mirror, a small little makeup mirror or a small six, six by four mirror that sub somebody can hold and direct the light onto the face itself. You could do that in exactly the same way if you haven't got a snoot where you could use um, <clears throat> some blacked out card pointing to off away from the sub uh, the subject. So a piece of blacked out card in front of your flash and then basically just with a narrow slit and then allowing the mirror to reflect the light back into the position that you need. So you can see how bad the dappled light, light is at times where it's coming through. So that's where we need to actually put the main exposure of the body either into the light, uh, the light source or we turn them away from the light source to counterbalance the light. <coughs> so when we understand what we're doing now, now we're exposing from the tummy towards the light. We've got the exposure. When we're photographing from uh, the light coming in from the behind, so it's the 10 o'clock position, it's crossing the body, it's creating the shadow. We can see the uh, increase in the shadow on the image. It means a sharper, smaller light, light source. Again, the exposure taken from the nose towards the light source. When we add in a sharper light to a softer light, it looks like there's a spotlight on it. That's exactly what we've done. Once more, though, we're meeting from the nose to the main light source. And if we want that new main light source to dominate the scene, it needs to be around about a stop. In the same way here, making sure we're dominating the scene with the exposure, with a small light going onto the body. So you can see here, during the course of a session, um, very, very similar body positions, but the focus of the light onto the sub uh, the subject is the essential part. What are we trying to light? There's going to be times where you want to light the face, you'll want to light the bust, you'll want to light the, but uh, the buttocks, um, and those are the kind of decisions that as the photographer you've got to make. So you can see here, once you start to apply these techniques, including ring flash at times for the younger set, a little bit more kind of the fun glamour girl, um, but then we can actually start to really create quite a big variety of images with a limited light lighting arsenal to create a maximum variety and effect for uh, maximizing the session and the sale. So I just thought because Kel Kelsey, we shoot so much, um, it's a great way to actually put that session flow together so you get an idea of how it all kind of comes together. So now let's take a look at the changing rooms film that I mentioned before. So um, in this case, uh, what we're uh, using is changing rooms, um, and that will, uh, it's a four, four parter. Um, I would definitely start at part one. I do apologize at me speaking for five or six minutes at the beginning of each one. They do insist that I do that for some reason. Let me just put this out in the chat panel for you. This is a link to part one. And the reason that I chose this is because um, in the changing rooms setting that we have here in Studio 2, um, we wanted to maximize the variety in basically not much bigger than a bedroom set. Obviously, we need a little bit more space um, for, the fil uh, for the filming and so on, but this will give you a really great idea of how things 
come together in a true flow. And especially if you're really looking to develop in your boudoir or your female photography, it will pretty much actually guide you right the way through on how we're going to do it. So the first thing I mentioned to you before about metering is that the dome always goes towards the light source. Now, if you're an experienced photographer, um, you can use the flat disc um, on your, me your meter and point that towards the light source. That has a slightly better, um, more accurate, within a tenth of a stop in the exposure compared to the dome, which allows for some of the shadow side. But if you're beginning to use a meter, I would start to actually use the dome first uh, because I can guarantee you, you'll take an exposure, you'll set the settings on camera once you're in manual mode, and then basically you'll look on the back of the screen and go, that looks a bit light or a bit dark, and then you're going to not believe in the meter and you're going to have to actually go ahead and basically change everything in post-production because you've not believed in the meter and you've changed your work or your working exposure during the whole shoot so remember have the dome out for now the more proficient you get start to work with the <clears throat> uh, the dome in so in this set setting uh, very similar we're going to walk our way through this shoot again um, and basically uh, the room set and everything else will basically be demolished <laughs> by the time I've done the shoot to maximize the variety and all we're going to be doing is moving the bed in and out of the set br bringing some uh, paper backdrops down to uh, add the kind of variety but the most important thing for me is that I always ensure that one light is doing one job so in other words um, in this photograph to begin with we've got our main light our key light on the right hand side uh, which is just around about here yep yeah? and basically it's got barn doors on it on a reflector dish so it's focused towards the light there's no diffuse sorry towards the subject there's no diffusion on the front it is pure raw flash but it's being controlled by the barn doors for its spillage but then in the background at the 10 o'clock position you've got a pure raw flash no reflector dish on that at all and that is trying to simulate sunlight coming through a window and it's going to speckle itself all all around the place so just like we saw in studio one We've got a, um, a different though light, light now because we're not using the big highlight. We're using uh, what I would refer to as a medium-sized softbox. Um, for some of you, it'll be large, um, but it's about medium size for us. It's about two meter, a uh, meter and a bit, I think. Uh, um, and then we've still got this other light that we saw in the first session, which is the uh, beaut uh, beauty dish with a honeycomb on the front, a big gridded light source. And that's on that poly stand, as you can see there. So um, if you look at where I'm photographing from, that is the six o'clock position. So then when we look at the soft box, that is at the nine o'clock feather position. And now we have the separation light at the one o'clock, uh, which is uh, coming in. So you can start to understand what it's doing. Remember what I was on about to you before. So the soft box is going to be my working exposure. It could be something like F4, 5, 6. And then whatever it is, then the uh, separation light or the hair, uh, the hair light is going to be set one stop less. And so from that, that is the kind of image that we get. So... Once uh, Charlotte, uh, this is the dance I was on about you, once she turns her head towards the light, uh, the light source, um, it will sli slightly flatten the light more instead of this lovely kind of big window light kind of quality what we've got going on. But the uh, part to look at is what the separation light is doing. If I didn't use the um, honeycomb grid on the beauty dish, then all the bed head, all the white wall, all, all the pillows would be overlit and it would be too bright within the scene. So we're looking to minimize the spillage of the light and to maximize the effect of the body. So when we start to uh, roll the subject onto their back, no, no difference here. The only thing we might have to watch out, out for is any spillage from the separation light specifically coming on towards the face. It's okay if we use the separation light itself as the key light. We'll see that now in a minute. Um, but what we don't want to do is to bring attention to body parts um, that are too kind of full. So you might have a woman who's recovering from preg a pregnancy, 
very body conscious at that point, putting a little bit more um, uh, body weight than she's been able to recover from. The last thing I want to do is actually emphasize any of that. So that's where we would actually start to disguise the body with material to actually minimize the uh, distraction of, uh, of uh, the body itself. So um, big, light, big light source gives big illumination then the controlled light source to bring the separation and um, three, the three-dimensional effect. So big soft, big soft box again. Now what we're doing though, as I said, we just uh, used a little bit of netting across the body, helps to the disguise. Then when we want to change it dramatically by just moving away from a soft box to the likes of a barn doors or a snoot will dramatically change the image. So here now these images we're going to be seeing are a, a barn doors is our key light. And that key light is coming in at around about the eight o'clock position as you, as you can see my new camera position. And now the uh, separation and the hair light is coming in at around about the 12 o'clock position. And that is still that gridded um, beauty dish. And now because we're minimizing the light spilling around the scene, remember that soft box by design, as the flash explodes and the light source is big, it wants to get bigger. Whereas we're using the likes of the barn doors, as the flash explodes, we're controlling the energy of the light and its direction by using the actual barn doors in exactly the same way as a snoop would um, or a honeycomb uh, grid would do. It's controlling the light for the spillage. Then when we start to just convert um, or move away from the um, barn doors being used as the main light and we just start to use the honeycomb grid from above, we get a dramatic effect again. Now, one of the benefits I have with the Elinchrom light uh, we talked about this, I think it was in session one or se session two of the Complete Guide to Light. It's the ability of the trigger to tell which flight, uh, which light to fire independent of all lights. <clears throat> so in this case, my key light is usually in group one and my separation light, uh, background light or hair light would, would be in group four. If you ever come to visit the studio for a workshop or whatever, you'll know my key light is always one, as I've just said. Then the left corner is group three. The right corner is group four. So theoretically, what we're seeing here is the right hand corner of the light, this light from above, honeycombed, big beauty dish focusing down, but being controlled in its spillage from uh, by just using that grid on the front. And now uh, we we can see um, the illumination coming in from the room lamp is just enough to actually give the glow rather than actually affect the scene. By keeping the same uh, gridded light for a minute, but having the option, you might just be able to see on the right hand side, you'll definitely see it in the film, is the barn doors are back in uh, place, but now they're being used as separation. So this is just the gridded light on the left hand side. And then this is the gridded light plus the honeycomb, uh, sorry, plus the barn, uh, the barn doors being used on the right. And when she turns towards me, of course, they swap their roles. So now the barn doors has to be my work and exposure and the gridded light is coming back into being a separation light. So remember, all I've got to do is make sure that I'm metering between each of the different set setups here, but technically we're only in second setup at this point. Now we're moving to third set setup. We're changing the accessory as the key light once more. In this case, we're using one of my favorite accessories um, for more fashion, more younger kind of style of photography. <coughs> and that is the deep dish reflector. Don't get that confused with a pizza, of course. Um, but the um, uh, sunlight reflector dish is it's true, it's true name. Um, basically, it gives me that. It's almost like a pure hot spot of light. It's raw flash again. <coughs> creates a deep shadow, but I like that. You might like, not like it. That's your problem, not mine. And um, that is creating the key light. So that's the main expo exposure. Now, depending on the flashes that you use, if we're trying to keep down to the likes of F4, F2.8, whatever, you're going to struggle with a lot of flash units, especially if they're at the budget range, um, because they won't be able to power down low enough or the reverse. They won't get up to enough power when you put a softbox on them. So when you're buying flash, you really do need to look ahead and actually the kind of what 
uh, aperture I'm going to use for the majority of photography and what am I going to put on the front of my light and how does that work and things. So remember, in this case, I'm using pretty much all raw flash, except the um, separation light is now at the 12 o'clock high. So this is coming in from above her, slightly behind her. It's still got the beauty dish on it, but it's got that gridded light still, and that's only acting as separation so you can see here, creates a really strong look and feel, quite fashionable and everything else by design, real pop light, I call, I call it. Then we start to look at the um, deep dish just by itself. Um, we don't have to use the key light from, uh, uh, sorry, the um, gridded light from above if we don't want, want to. But you can all also see from this screen grab, in fact, the modeling bulb is on very bright. So at any stage, if I want to swap into just using it as a tungsten light, I can do that straight uh, straight away. One of the benefits of uh, working with uh, tungsten as the uh, modeling bulb is it also warms up the room set. So especially if you were uh, working from a cold premises, um, the uh, the uh, modeling bulb itself will actually increase the heat if it's running at high. But you, you can see how beautiful and strong that light is going through. So now we're just using the deep reflector dish by itself and obviously um, just controlling its height. So as the model stands up, the light has to move upwards. It's the only thing that is lighting that background as well. The shadow is coming in the right-hand side. So that left-hand image is one light source uh, you can see coming through. And it's just being shot from very high. <clears throat> and that's where we're getting a little bit of touch of light coming on the top of the arm. Whereas the image on the right-hand side, obviously when she sits, says sitting down now, we need to lower that light source down more. So it's uh, still going to create the shadow direction on the nose that we re require. When in the fourth set setup, um, when the um, model is laying down on the floor and I'm photographing from above, I'm going to use a, a mixture of lights, but again, one light to do one job. In this case, I'm using a deep reflector dish as the key, uh, the key light. That's that big bright light source again that looks like the sun. And then we've got the gridded light overhead for control. But remember, at any stage, I can switch one of them off just from the trigger on the top of the camera um, and tell either group one or group four to fire and obviously just the uh, exposure uh, as necessary. So you can see the difference here. Great shadows, great creation, looks like that sunlit window light kind of thing. When I want to uh, add a, a more kind of a daylight effect and all I've got is basically a big white wall or I've just kind of create some kind of light coming through, taking the reflector dish off the backlight. So you can see it here at the 11 o'clock position, uh, 10 o'clock from technically where camera is. Um, but basically what it's doing, it's overpowering. It's designed now to actually flood back towards and almost bleach everything out. So in the same way as we did it in the base, uh, basic set, setups I was showing you, where we were looking at the um, uh, light from the softbox and we were having to use a reflector dish, a uh, reflector, I should say, the panel, to pop in a bit of the light. Here we're using the barn doors on this light near me, uh, just at the five o'clock position, uh, position. That's the key light source. But then when we see the image, you can see how bright it is and it almost kind of bleeds back and it's got a great fashion light. Now you can't use that on every, every sub, sub subject. So it might be a part of your boudoir flow in the fifth setup, but again, it's not going to suit everybody. So you've got to be aware of how full their figure is. Six setup now, we're using that deep dish, high, and then we're trying to create this lovely kind of effect from uh, above. She's just leaning against the wall. The light is technically right against the wall. You can see the lovely shape coming through from the deep dish itself. And I've got the, op uh, the option to either use the barn doors as se se separation as the image is on the left-hand side, or not at all, as you see in the image on the right-hand side. So when the light is from above, you can see that pool of light. It's being controlled. It's all, it's almost a street light effect in its shape and kind of radiation. And so we can create some real kind of fun effects, uh, kind of as far as the lighting is concerned. If I bring the uh, barn doors back in, uh, it's still really a part of my setup of the six set, the setup with it. But now the actual uh, barn doors and the um, 
deep dish are kind of working together to light the whole scene. And this is the problem where one light is not doing one job. They are mixing into the overall expose, exposure, and that's why it just looks a little bit confusing. <laughs> I forgot to change the image on the right-hand side. Anyway, okay, then six setup once more, just you are using the lights from different directions. So we can see now that the uh, deep dish is at the nine o'clock position, and then the, uh, barn, the barn doors is at the two o'clock position. So when I'm allowing it to illum illuminate but not fire, it starts to actually uh, light some of the whole room up. <clears throat> um, but when I want to uh, uh, kind of create a little bit more dynamic onto uh, the image, I need to control that backlight more. So don't allow it to spill. And that is just feathering the, um, uh, both the deep dish and the actual barn at uh, the barn doors so it doesn't spill onto the background as much. Seven set setup then, uh, because I've got obviously the church windows here, this is studio two, the smallest student studio. I uh, just brought up uh, one of my administration staff, uh, Debbie had to disappear off. I always work with a, fe a female assistant uh, when I'm photographing. And even if I was a woman, I would still work with a female assistant when I'm shooting bird boudoir. Um, but here, what I've done, um, I've just uh, you are using a small um, light on a stick. So in other words, on a collapsed stand. <clears throat> and that's job is to overpower the background by one stop. <coughs> so if the natural light falling onto the bed was creating, let's say, a working exposure of 125th at f4, the flash would be metered up to 5.6. <coughs> Oh, I do. Sorry, I am sorry. The flash would be metered to 5.6, and then the working exposure on camera would be 5.6, then, of course. And that will help then to kind of um, show that the flash is dominating the exposure instead of just mixing in. And of course, the eighth set up here is only the ambient light source and just using the natural light within the scene to create the last and final images. And that's our session. That's lighting for boudoir. So as you can see, what we covered there was using a bit of the window light at the end, setting up the flash and choosing the right accessories to actually do the job. Soft light versus the hard light. Now, I know some of you will not like the hard light and some of you will not like the soft light. That's fine. <coughs> That's what makes us different as photographers. And then we've basically got the uh, continuous light source versus the flash. There is times to use it, um, especially if you're beginning to work with very small lights so you don't have enough flash. Just just going down to your local DIY shop or car manufacturing, uh, car uh, car parts, I mean, like a, Hal a Halfords in U in UK, just picking up some cheap little LED, five, five pound each, whatever. As long as you're in a darkened room, they're going to have effect. You just be able to tape them on or clip them onto old light stands to create little light sources like you've seen in this image. Um, but more often than not, you're going to get frustrated with big light and you're going to want to shrink the light source down to a little bit more of a small light to get more drama, especially as you become more and more proficient during your shoot. So uh, here, as I said, we've base, basically got small lights spilling around the place in a very specific areas to give a three-dimensional effect. And then as far as the uh, uh, color balance is concerned, obviously I would always go for a warm light rather than a soft light. And that's it. At this stage, I'd usually say any questions, Jay, but happy birthday to you, Jay, anyway. And let's go to the question panel and see, and see what we've got. When I say let's go to the question panel, it's me having to read now for a minute. So <laughs> bear, with, uh, bear with me, yeah? Let me just bring my question panel out. So um, how does this uh, compare with and without a reflector? Would you use a flash or do you like reflectors more? I always try to use a natural light before reflector, reflector before flash, and flash as a last resort. The problem when you're using flash as a fill, it will actually make itself big by design and start to wrap around the whole place and start to bring all the shadow elements to life, even if it's controlled to the two stops less that we usually try and get to. Um, I usually opt for a reflector 
um, where possible, especially if we're only working with one person uh, because it's quicker and I can physically see it in front of me uh, rather than actually um, taking the technical time to actually set up another fill, fill light. Um, will the bedside lights give a color cast? Are you going to use a daylight bulb? We always use a tungsten bulb because I like to bring the extra warmth in towards the scene. Obviously, in a commercial world, if I was having to create a commercial effect, we would actually uh, add gel around the bulb, which would be particularly color balanced to make sure we had a perfect balance with our flash, or we'd be using tungsten light <clears throat> to match the actual light. And so we'd be gelling the key light and all the other flash in the scene to match the bulbs that are in the environment. Um, not bud, uh, boudoir, but light in question. Would you light a group of people around six people from one end and feathered? Uh, yes, we would and go back and watch that. The next session is about lighting the, fam the family and we're going to talk about that specifically. So uh, watch out for that one in, in many way. Um, do you skin softening, smoothing software in the post? Uh, I don't use any third par uh, party skin softening. It's a variety of actions that I've made up, which is called uh, soft one two three four so I just decide exactly what soft I want pretty much uh, I'll try the different ones on the different uh, um, client first and then I'll opt for one skin softening across the whole image obviously if I need to actually sharp sharpen anything uh, that's very rare rarely in boudoir but I'm using use I'm usually using a softness on the skin and not just on the whole set. Uh, I often do add uh, most of the work, though, is done in the raw. So as far as the contrast, as far as the vignette, all that kind of element is done in the raw. But I do have to run an action uh, to actually put the softness on the front of the actual image itself before finish. Um, thanks very much for all the thanks about the webinar. Um, Okay, please recap saying the light uh, from behind is twice as bright. Okay, so there's the, the, it is a, a very old saying. I've got no idea where it comes from. I was put, taught it straight out of uh, uh, kind of the first thing, not from portrait photographers, from uh, the commercial guy that I used to work for. And basically, if we metered the light, so if we metered the key light, the same as the backlight or vice versa, I should say. So in other words, if I metered from the, uh, the back of the head towards the light source to say F5.6, which is the same as the main light, so from the nose to the light source, the actual light come in uh, as it touched the skin, it would cre increase its brightness by twice the amount. That's why we all always by design straight away knock the um, uh, separation and the background light down by one stop instantly before we do anything else. Otherwise, we're going to start bleaching things out unless we want to use that for effect, of course. Uh, will bedside lights give it a cast? Yes, we talked about that. Um, DDD, I've just lost all the question panel. That's not a good idea. So we do need Jay, but it is his birth his birthday today? I won't tell you all the old old he is, but he's a lot younger than me. Uh, where where do you get the gels from? Okay, so. I, uh, we still buy stage lighting gels, so they do a color effects and they do basically a, a color correction. So we use, uh, usually buy everything from a stage lighting company, but uh, the likes of the Flash Center, they actually sell kits um, by Roscoe and by Lee, I believe, as well. So you can buy either color correction. Um, often we refer and we have referred to in the series of uh, Complete Guide to Light already about color temperature orange, which is basically the tungsten uh, color. So if I wanted to match a tungsten bulb with the flash, I would add the tungsten gel to the actual <clears throat> um, uh, flash okay so then we actually shoot then in tungsten mode on camera and then all the color balance is the same together remember i mentioned about continuous light and small little leds that you can get from some of the garages uh, remember the leds that are so cheap are basically cheap because they come from the outside of the bake the cheap part of the led all these expensive lights that are sold led wise like the manfrotto's and else are right from the the core of the bake the perfect color um, as the LEDs go out and out and out, they get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as they're made because the color is basically uh, out at the far ends. They don't cook as well and so on and so on. Um, 
when I updated to Photoshop CC, my Nix software has stopped working. Is there a quick fix? Um, I've got no idea. I don't use uh, Nix, soft, Nix software. It usually goes into the setting in Photoshop in preferences and third party plug plug plugins and you usually just point it towards your Nick software I believe okay uh, that might be the same for the likes of the on one fill fill filters or reload your Nick filter again and that should do the same job <clears throat> Um, is the big reflector panel um, just a DIY shop per, per, uh, purchase and what kind of stand was used for? Okay, so yes, it's the big polystyrene sheets. It's commercially what we've used for donkey's years. Um, it makes it quite easy, easy and light to store. We usually paint one side black or dark gray and the other side is painted white. Um, we Okay, so this is where you can't tell my wife now, right? Because I tell her there is no other... Um, bike stand they're actually bike stands okay and i buy the plastic 15 pound ones but they do some really really cheap metal ones for about five five quid online but they end up that i've got to actually paint the polystyrene more because obviously the plastic doesn't rub the paint off the polystyrene like the metal does and things really so if you ever made the debbie I, I buy the plastic ones because they're the only ones that are available you never tell your partner or your partner how much you spend on on stuff okay ever that's like between me and you um, as far as the variety that you shoot in a boudoir session, how many shots would you recommend? Um, I always want to shoot around about 48 photographs to show the client. I'll probably shoot uh, within about an hour, around about two to 300 images. We'll do a quick edit, but I reverse edit. And I would watch uh, some of the films on the acad Academy to do with um, a work workflow. My workflow is done through Bridge and Camera Raw, which is a part of Photoshop CC in Photoshop beforehand. I'm not a Lightroom fan, it's too slow. Um, so Bridge and Camera Raw has been around for a lot longer than Light and Lightroom has. And um, basically anything you can do in Lightroom, I can do quicker. Um, I'm sure there's a song there somewhere anyway. Uh, as far as, is there a different light source to the different age of client? Uh, yes, um, so that's what I was trying to say before, was the, the difference really is that I can use and get away with harder light source on a more toned subject and a younger toned subject than I can with a fuller or older. Now, <clears throat> Saying that, I could have a client coming through that's middle fifties, but basically, you know, is a gym bunny and she's absolutely toned. Her makeup is perfection and so on. And I can use the same lighting on her as I could on a 21 year old without any trouble at all. You basically, obviously through practice and knowledge, you basically learn to actually adjust your light source to the subject in front of you. Um, you know, one of the reasons we use a big soft light source is to soften the wrinkles. Um, often with boudoir, we're bleaching out the skin a fraction so we're losing that skin detailing that you might want you think but obviously the glow action alone will kind of uh, 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 just get rid of that straight away the high uh, the highlight um, what size do you use well I've basically got all of the sizes the most popular size for me is the uh, eight seven isn't it the biggest. Um, they also do the 7.6, which is a good size, and we've got the 7x5 one as well. Um, make sure it fits in your home. Um, and please, please, please don't get frightened off by folding them away. Once you've learned how to do it, it might take you a dozen times to learn how to do it, but just keep on doing it, and basically it'll fold away just like a reflector does anyway. Where do you get the netting from? <laughs> Ikea, okay, it's the same, I don't know if you can see here, I feel like I'm in a boudoir setting uh, here, but they had to, when we moved into this little room to actually do all the webinars from, I'm not sure if you can see, but basically they put a canopy in, which is just some cheap, cur some cheap curtain and everything else, and all the windows are lined with netting to try and kill some of the, oh, I've screwed up the webcam now, um, but to kill some of the sound uh, kind of reflection and things really are. It's beyond my kind of technical abilities. Um, but yeah, it's just a, a cheap IKEA curtain with it. Last, uh, Lasterlight, in fact, saw what we were doing and they basically created a kit to go on the front of the highlight, uh, which actually allows the curtain to, uh, it's like a pole that clips onto the highlight. So if you're taking it around and photographing in clients' homes and you want it to look like a window, that's really why I use the net, net in as a part of my set. 
like you're seeing in that uh, top photograph there. It's a part of the set and not just a light source. So in other words, if um, that was a highlight behind her legs and not a, win a window, it would just look like it wasn't a big soft, big soft box. Um, how many sets would you use in a shoot? Um, pretty much, um, I I'm only really looking at a three-sided studio. And if you've ever been on a workshop with, with me, you know, even though we've got really big spaces here, um, I'm always looking to actually shoot in a bit of a U. So if I change camera position from a six to a new six, in other words, if I move from a six o'clock to a nine o'clock or from a six o'clock to a three o'clock, so I create a new position for the camera, whatever is behind it, I want to actually be a part of the look and the feel. So it'll be slightly different for a family studio to a teen studio to a boudoir studio and so on and so on. Um, but even things like, um, um, screens, uh, chairs, you know, um, even the kind of the netting that we were on about before kind of allows uh, kind of that little bit of variety in things, really. I think that's the last of our question. Bam, bam, bam. That's it. Brill. So I'm glad we survived without Jay. Uh, he is brilliant. So please tell him that you missed him a lot on the next webinar. And Mark was rubbish without him because that will make his day and it is his birthday now. So I'd like him to feel special when he gets back and things really. Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying doing this uh, complete guide to light out. I forget, in fact, um, kind of the different uh, films that we've created during the past 10 years and everything else with it and things. And it was the team's idea that we kind of use some of them towards the, the middle part of this complete guide to light series. Remember, it's not due to finish until October and you can rewatch them on the Academy at any stage. And as I said, we're going to have an accompanying PDF book for mem members uh, late in October, October as well. So that's it guys. Thanks for joy uh, joining me on a, another webinar. Um, I believe it's at this stage that Jay would do some kind of promotion of what's coming up next. So let's have a look what's coming up next. On the live events page, we've basically got uh, a live Academy photo critique on the 30th of um, April. Uh, remember to get those images in um, up until 12 hours beforehand. Do it sooner rather than later. I've got another session on the biz um, which is on the 21st of May. We've got a Photoshop Live. We haven't actually done Photoshop Live for a couple of months now. So we've got a full on. So get your requests in there, anything that you really want us to cover. Um, I've got then uh, my fine art mail um, workshop uh, on the 2nd of June and the 24th of August, my two day one. I've only got one space left on that two day one as well. That's going to be absolutely amazing. <clears throat> Um, um, we're going to be shooting in war, in water. And anyway, I won't surprise it all late into the night on the one night and the one night and things really, uh, uh going to have some, uh, some fun anyway. But as I was saying to you, if you want to check out the changing room studio boudoir with it, I've put the link in the chat panel. So click that before I switch off the webinar and then you'll be able to actually go and watch it at some, some stage. Remember at any point you can favorite your film. Um, so you can actually come back to it or go into your panel so you can watch, watch it again just by clicking on save to my favorites. And then if you go into your account, you'll basically find it in your favorites there. Thanks everybody. Enjoy your Easter break. Don't eat too much chocolate. Otherwise you end up like me. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.